Hi, we're Quaint and Curious Volumes. My name is James. Today, I'm going to talk about cannons and kits and the Western Cannon Starter Kit and what happened to me when I read all the books on that list. If you're not familiar, the Western Cannon Starter Kit is a series of videos created by uh, veteran YouTuber and professional book critic Steve Donahue. Um, he made these videos about seven years ago, I think, and they were in response to um, something he said that he he would hear from time to time from friends and acquaintances, people who felt that their educations had not given them a thorough grounding um, in the the what sometimes was called the great books, uh, the Western tradition, what have you. And how people would say that they wish they could take some time off and dedicate themselves to the study and, and learn all the things that they missed out on when they were in school. You know, uh, I suppose, for example, you, you know, you went to, to school and you studied business or engineering because you were told this was the way you were going to make a living and then but you still had an interest in these things and you never really felt fully real, well read you know um and so he said you know you can uh become well read in the classics of western literature and it doesn't have to take that much time uh so that's thus the idea of the starter kit um so a starter kit is a kind of a concise uh list of books that will kind of familiarize you with the landscape, um, you know, let you know, make you familiar with uh, the highlights, the things that have cast the longest shadows, I think he says at one point. And then he has three ground rules for thinking about this Western canon starter kit project. One is that there's no wrong way to enjoy reading. You don't have to care about the Western canon. You don't have to care about tradition. You don't have to be concerned with, you know, reading all the great books. Or you, it's not a contest, and you don't have to impress people. If all you want to do is uh, is is read tentacle romance, go ahead and do that. As long as you enjoy it, that's fine. And you shouldn't let anyone tell you any different. Uh, but given number one, if you want. To pursue a program of familiarizing yourself with this Western canon, there is a right and a wrong way to do it, and the wrong way is haphazard, which is how most people, middle-aged people with, you know, bookish people who have jobs and families and um, other responsibilities, you know, you, you, you pick up Chaucer here, or you go and watch a Shakespeare play there, but you don't go through it in a systematic way, and the systematic way is the right way and it's systematic um, in the sense that it's linear because literature is linear and um, everyone who writes something in this tradition was a reader first and so they've they've read many of the things that came before so if you're if you're reading Dante well you know he's read the Bible you also um, know that he's read Virgil because he mentions him and you also can presume that he's read some Homer right so, do you read Dante and then read Virgil and Homer in the Bible? No. Well, if you want to do it systematically, you will read it in order. And the third, what we're talking about is the Western canon, and there's no alternate canon. Um, this is these are the books that are most have been most influential um, in the tradition of England, Europe, and North America. Um, so, without getting into arguments about the, the validity of canons or uh, the how weighted this is towards uh, white men, <laughs> and they're pretty much all dead, and most of them are men. Um, I, today we would call them, most of them white, they probably wouldn't have thought of themselves that way, but there you have it. So, <clears throat> so about a year and a half ago I was watching these videos, and I'd been, for a while, going back and reading a lot of these classics. Probably for about the last 
seven years myself. So, but I was not watching uh, Steve Donahue on BookTube. I wasn't watching a lot of YouTube. But, you know, I'd gotten inter interested a little bit in Plato, and so I, you know, I read The, the Republic and uh, a bunch of the dialogues. Um, I, I decided, you know, I keep reading a lot of things reference uh, all these Greek tragedies. I have a notion of what they are. I'd read a couple of them, but I got a big book of them, and I, I, I read through all of those over a couple of months. And, you know, I, was, I found that I was kind of enjoying the way that I was filling in some of these gaps in my own knowledge. Uh, and then when I found this Western kind of star kit, I'd been looking at different lists and kind of haphazardly going through, like the the um, Modern Library 100 books of the 20th century. Uh, I think that was the first one that I said, I'm going to read through this list. I didn't read through that whole list. Um, it's very eccentric. But the Western kind of star kit, it's about 100 books. And it is manageable. Um, I skipped some of the ones that I had read recently. So if I'd read it within the last three to five years, I, I did not read it again. If, for the most part, some I did. Um, and I went in order. So I started with the Bible. And um, one thing that, that Steve recommends in his uh, video on the Bible is reading a selection of books, so not the whole thing. Um, he starts off with Genesis and Exodus and then skips the next three books of the Pentateuch. So then you go to Joshua and Judges and Ruth. So you're getting more of the, um, the narrative, the story of the Bible and skipping things like, um, you know, Deuteronomy with its lists of... Um, dietary restrictions and the precise way to slaughter a cow and and whatnot uh, and he also skips a lot of the books with a lot of prophesying as he says empty prophesying also um steve suggests that you read a good modern t translation like the new international version and that that is the one that i read i i did actually kind of flip between reading some in New International Version and some in the King James Version. Um, and, you know, when I read the King James Version now, because I've read so many of these kind of antique books, uh, it doesn't seem that old-fashioned to me. It's, it seems a lot more straightforward. But you really can't, as a, as a modern person, you can't do better than the New International Version. It's, it's very clear. Um, and understandable because it? it's meant to be. Um, so I would, I would, uh, I would second that recommendation that you read a good modern translation. Now, as far as the books that he skips, he he intends that this is going to make it less intimidating because you're not reading this big brick; you're reading a, a selection. And he says, and this is not true, but he says when you add it up, this is no longer than a 200-page novel. Okay, this is. Genesis, Exodus, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, uh, Psalms, Lamentations, uh, uh, book First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, Chronicles. This is a, a lot of stuff, and most of the New Testament. So all the Gospels and Acts and um, the Epistles of Saint Paul. Well, there's not a lot left in the New Testament after you after you've read those. So I don't. It's really not 200 pages. Maybe if you just read the Gospels and Acts and like the first couple of epistles, that's 200 pages. But it's, <laughs> he, he, uh, he miscalculated there. Sorry, Steve. But what I, uh, what I did was I started off following that program and I said, I'm reading this thing. I'm reading this whole thing. Uh, maybe I'll just circle back. I circled back. I read Deuteronomy and Numbers and... and uh, and the other one, the Pentateuch, I just said, I'm just going to go all in. And I read the whole thing. Um, so, so that is what I would recommend to you, maybe, is consider reading the whole thing uh, if, you're if you're going to follow this path. Um, 
you know, reading Deuteronomy, it's it's not thrilling reading, but you can kind of, you can kind of skim a lot of it. <laughs> so maybe you say, all right, I get the, I see, okay, they're still going on about where you splash the blood, and uh, okay, all right, yep, getting it. Okay, so yeah, you can you can kind of skim some of that. All right, um, and reading the Bible and reading the and reading Homer, there you are getting the stuff that pretty much everyone in the West, uh, up until the 20th century, you could pretty much be sure that they read the Bible, um, that they read the Iliad and probably the Odyssey. Uh, so the Iliad and the Odyssey are the next two. Uh, obviously, you know, these are usually influential. Even up to today, you see references to all these things. People are writing Madeline Miller, for example, made a has made a pretty good career of retelling these stories from the Odyssey and the Iliad. Um, and it does take time to read them, but there are great new translations, lots of different translations. And as he suggests, go and familiarize yourself with the whole history of the Trojan War before you start. Um, and most most new translations will have a good introduction that will tell you that whole story so that when you're coming in in the middle um, you're not lost because the people who these books were written for uh, would have known that whole story um, and would not have been lost anyway uh, at, let, let's go on move on um, the later Greek literature and this is a very good uh, list of you know I'm, I'm not a classicist by any means but you know these are his list of, of plays and philosophical works from from the ancient Greeks R really is these are the ones that I wanted to read that I wanted to have on my my list that I, I would have put on a list of things to that I wanted to read to be familiar with because you see them referenced and um, alluded to all over so that's Agamemnon libation bearers humanities Hippolyte Medea uh, Oedipus, Antigone, and the comedy Lysistrata. I would probably also add the other Oedipus, um, Oedipus of Colonus, to, uh, to fill it out. But yeah, these are all fantastic. Um, and then Plato's Crito, Euthyphro, Symposium, and Apology, and the Republic, um, and then Aristotle, and then you have to read Aristotle, the Nicomachean e Ethics and Poetics. Um, you know, up until you get to Nicomachean Ethics, this whole thing, even including the Bible, this is pretty good reading. Um, and Aristotle, I kind of ran into that like a brick wall. The first half of Nicomachean Ethics, I, I, I think I still can recall kind of an outline of it and what I got from it. Um, the second half is a little fuzzier to me. Uh, poetics is, you know, if you, if you study any kind of artistic field, You'll see all kinds of references to Aristotle's poetics, uh, the ideas of of um, uh, the the unities in in a a dramatic work. You know, unity of time and unity of place. And uh, what's the other the one thing that everyone knows about about Aristotle's poetics and the word that I'm I'm blanking on how it uh, helps you expunge your intense feelings by watching it, it'll come back to me later. Anyway, maybe I'll just uh, post a video tomorrow where it will just be me saying that one word because it'll come to me. Um, so that's really good. And, <clears throat> and after that, there's the uh, video on the Romans. And Steve Donnie was a, a big fan of, of Roman history and Roman literature and poetry. He only picks two works. And if you're all going to read only two works from ancient Rome, it's, it should be these two. It's the Aeneid by Virgil and, and Ovid's Metamorphoses. Um, so, uh, and yeah, after those two, it's hard to say what is the third, right? Because the, these, these two works are the ones that everyone um, references. And having read the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Aeneid, you see kind of the, the echoes in the Aeneid. You know what um, Aeneas's backstory is because he was in the Iliad. He was a Trojan, a uh, Trojan warrior who uh, escaped the uh, the final destruction of Troy 
Sorry, I should have said spoiler alert. Um, and Ovid's Metamorphoses is, is kind of a, a series of, uh, of linked stories in, in poem form uh, that tell, it's just the history of the world, from creation up to um, the present day for him, which was uh, early Imperial Rome. Uh, and the stories in Ovid, later on, you'll, you'll see these stories retold over and over and referenced over and over. Uh, so, then there's the Middle Ages, Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso, Decameron, and Canterbury Tales. It's, or yeah, So it, it's uh, basically three works, right? Dante, uh, Boccaccio, and Chaucer. Um, Dante, I found, for me, slow going, and you will want to have a, a good modern copy. I read it in three different translations. But they all had good, uh, good notes. They all had different uh, strengths. My favorite, surprisingly, um, was Paradiso. <laughs> so, uh, when you got to Paradise, uh, or I'm sorry, my favorite was Purgatory. Um, Paradiso um, it gets a little trippy in a way, uh, but Purgatory, you have some at least you have some progression, some Im improvement, right? Everyone in Inferno is stuck where they are. Um, everyone, you know, and the drama is from the the uh, elaborate tortures and uh, and th th there's something kind of funny about uh, Dante writing this story where he goes and visits the underworld and all he sees is like dead people who he hates. <laughs> and it's like, see, I told you. He's, he's using... One of the greatest works of literature he writes, but he just can't help settling some scores while he's at it. Um, Boccaccio's Decameron, that's going to, you're already seeing all these retellings of, of Ovid in there, or things that are kind of in the same uh, tradition of, of humor, and the same for the Canterbury Tales. Uh, I read the Canterbury Tales in the Neville Coghill version, which is, you know, modernized. I would like to read it again in um, in the original Middle English. I, of course, read it in, in college as an English major. I read parts of Decameron and parts of the Canterbury Tales. Uh, so then he goes on to what he calls the Italian Renaissance, though there are, there's not a lot of Italy on his list. Uh, Mort d'Artour by um, Sir Thomas Mallory, which is an English work, uh, a prose work that tells the King Arthur stories, uh, which had been written by various French and English writers, uh, and, and Mallory sort of was one of the first to compile them all into a, a single narrative. Uh, Machia Machiavelli, The Prince, is, uh, is on here, a very short work, it's something you've no doubt heard referenced all your life, um, and it doesn't take long to read, so it is worth spending the time to read it and to know this thing that people refer to all the time. Uh, Don Quixote by uh, Cervantes, er, um, the essays of Michel Montaigne and uh, Erasmus's Praise of Folly are also on the, uh, the Renaissance list. You know, once you're getting into the Renaissance, things kind of open up a bit, uh, or quite a bit, and he could have gone in, in many directions with this, but sure, I mean, Don Quixote and and Montaigne and and Machiavelli it, it definitely worth worth reading. And these are ones that I had not read even in XR before, so I, so that was very very. I mean, Don Quixote, I don't know. I will have to read it again someday. I liked it, but I found it it kind of wore on me after a while. To be, to be totally honest, Montaigne was kind of an, an up and down thing for me. Uh, I really had to be in the right frame of mind. So I read Montaigne over a, over a couple of months because, you know, I would pick it up and really not be. It wouldn't be clicking like my the the gears of my mind weren't quite engaging and and I wasn't getting much out of it um, all the time. But sometimes sometimes I I could I could get on his his wavelength. Um, and understand. And you'll find that with a lot of these things, this, th these old books. Sometimes you, you know, it's not like 
picking up a novel that's made for you know, a modern person and that's made to be entertaining and breezy. You know, you, 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 you can't pick up most of these books at the end of the day when you're tired. You can't, um, you know, just skim them or read a few pages on a, on a coffee break. Uh, it, it takes time to, to get started. It takes time to, to get into it for most of these. Uh, Boccaccio is the camera, and I think you could probably read one or two of those on a on a lunch break, and that'd be okay. But Erasmus, Montaigne, Machiavelli, not really, not really. So next he says, okay, well, here's Shakespeare, and just read all of Shakespeare. All the plays, all the poems, and all of the sonnets. So that took me a while, and I had read many of these before. I would even read Hamlet um, just the previous year, but I set aside a couple months, I read all of them, and I watched uh, video productions of as many that I, as I could find. I could find almost all of them. So if you are, uh, if you are stuck for a, a production of uh, Love's Labor's Lost that you want to, to watch, uh, hit me up. I will, I will make my recommendations for you. They're not all very often performed, so... Uh, some of them I had to find, um, like community theater productions filmed in a park in Spokane or something, and on a handheld camera uh, for for a couple of them. Um, but reading all of Shakespeare, you know, it you will find that it definitely gets easier to read it as you go on because, you know, all those uh, references that you have to look up or the 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 characteristic, uh, you know, locutions and, and word choices uh, or and meanings, you will have acquired them by after reading the first few, and, and you will not need to refer. Um, you, one thing Steve recommends, which is very impractical for most people, is to have a bunch of people sitting around and part out, parcel out the uh, parts and just uh, read it aloud to each other, doing the different parts among you. Um, you know, if you're a uh, introverted bookworm like myself, I, I mean, I can barely say hello to the the checkout person at the at the supermarket. How how am I going to have people over in my house to do a play? They're just going to make fun of me, right? They're going to be like, "I ain't coming over your house. Uh, anyway." So, um, but oh, my recommendation if you're thinking about. I got a bunch of, so I bought all these plays and and uh, and poems, and I got most of them in the Arden Shakespeare edition. I found that really Arden, especially the later ones, is too much. Um, there's too much uh, apparatus, uh, scholarly apparatus. You'll have a page with you know this much text and this much notes, and most of the notes will be on you know how this line goes in the Dryden edition. And that's not helping that's not helping the average reader. I think I think the Folger editions where you have the text on one side, you have the notes which are much more geared to modern people trying to understand Elizabethan references are on the left side, the text is on the right side. Each um each uh, scene has a brief summary before it starts which uh, can be helpful, especially when you're getting started, so you're not so much worrying about following the action um, that you miss uh, the language. And, uh, you know, the action and the language are important, but uh, taking some of that burden off, especially when you're first encountering these plays, is is very helpful. Um, and especially when you get into some of the history plays, the Henry the Sixth plays, where there's all this scene, the side switching and references to the Duke of this and the Duke of that and, and all these various earls can get confusing. But, um, yeah, so I really like that. Um, and I was surprised because, well, you know, by this point, you're getting a lot of, a lot of the references from your earlier reading from Ovid. You know, it's, uh, they say that Shakespeare was familiar with Ovid um, and of course, he was familiar with the Bible, though not the King James version. But uh, uh, I forget what version it was. But it was the the English translation during his day? Um, after after that is Paradise Lost by 
John Milton and the poetry of John Donne. Um, so Paradise Lost, after reading all of Shakespeare, is um, not that difficult. And after reading the Bible, that is helpful as well, obviously. Uh, so, you know, but as, as someone someone famous famously said of Paradise Laws, no one wished it were longer. You know, it's, it's I don't know if I'm going to reread re Paradise Lost. I'll probably reread Paradise Lost. And John Donne. So John Donne I read over several months. I, I got a Norton collection of his poetry. Um, and, you know, I thought that the religious material, which was at the end of the collection, it was like secular poems were in the front, like the, uh, uh, the satires and the elegies were at the front, and then the, the uh, holy sonnets and et cetera were at the end. I found that the religious material, the, the holy sonnets and uh, all those other religious poems were, for me, by this point, a lot more comprehensible than the secular ones. Uh, for example, you know, the, the so-called satires, um, which are kind of depend on you knowing a bunch of things about um, what was going on in London and at the inns of court, you know, among the law students in London during John Donne's day, um, which can be, you know, it's okay, but once you're into the Holy Sonnets, if you've read the Bible and you've been reading all these other religious works, um, those things are just kind of in there, and you have you have the references. And I found that even though I am not a person of faith, I am not a religious person, knowing all this religious, all this Christian background and and lore um, helped me to understand that in a way that I had a harder time with his secular stuff. Um, you know, all, all the things about really wanting to have sex. I, I don't mean to brag, but I have. Um, anyway, got, moving on. You're not here for that. Uh, this isn't that kind of channel. So, the 18th century, there's just three works. They're all early novels. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift, and then Defoe's Robinson Crusoe and Moll Flanders. I would read Gulliver's Travels again. I don't think I will read Robinson Crusoe again. It kind of wore on me. Um, Ma Flanders was a little more entertaining than Robinson Crusoe, but uh, I also don't think I'll re read that one. Um, it's... I didn't feel like I really liked Defoe. I didn't like Robinson Crusoe, who poor guy was going to try and get a bunch of slaves so he could make more money on his sugar plantation in Brazil and oh no he got he got shipwrecked uh yeah i mean look i'm i'm not trying to import modern day morality and ethics into into this book but and also these books it would would it kill you to use a chapter okay the chapter it will make you appreciate the invention of the chapter, reading Defoe, because there's no chapters. It's just, and every paragraph is one sentence. <laughs> and they're very long. Um, so, yeah, I, I expected that I would like Crusoe, um, because it's, it's such a kind of universally, uh, well, I mean, it's widely beloved classic, you know, even in... Um, in our town, you know, the, uh, the I think it's the newspaper writer who says, you know, we don't have a lot of a lot of uh, culture around here, but you know, we have the Bible and Robinson Crusoe; those are the the favorites. I'm like, okay, well, if you know, if everyone, even these uh, backwards hill people in New Hampshire, uh, like this book, why not me? I don't, they don't like it. Um, okay, so I'm going a little out of order of what. Steve did, because he saved these for later, but after that is all the, uh, the six novels of Jane Austen. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I read all of those. I, I didn't read Pride and Prejudice on this, on this go with this time around, because I'd read Pride and Prejudice, like, two years earlier. So, but I hadn't read any of the others. So, 
um, yeah, so I read the, I read the other five. Uh, I think I said before Persuasion was a favorite. Mansfield Park was just definitely not a favorite. That was one I read last. Um, so I was, I was, I was familiar with the, the Jane Austen style and the way of writing, and I was, so I wasn't struggling with that the way that uh, one might when first encountering that. But uh, yeah, they're all they're all really good. My favorite, Persuasion, um, Sense and Sensibility, and Northanger Abbey. Nashville Park, not so crazy about. Emma, I think Emma is the one I would be most likely to read again because I wasn't that crazy about it the first time, and I want to read it again just to see uh, if it's me. I got me. I got. I got to give that one another another chance. Um, and the others, I, I would I would read again because I I liked them. Uh, so the next video that he does, this is going to be very long, was the Victorians. And you want to watch the Western kind of story kid on the Victorians for one very important reason. It's the first appearance on video of little Frida as an eight-week-old puppy. She doesn't even have a name yet. And she chomps on Steve's nose ferociously. And he puts her down and does the rest of the video with these two large uh, marks on either side of his nose uh, where she had been chomping his nose. But she is just adorable. Um, she didn't even have a name then, so you, you want to go see see that. Um, and speaking of, of that, my little dog is starting to whine at me, so <clears throat> maybe I ought to call this a, a, a part one, and I will return to you with my thoughts on the Victorians, uh, the American 19th century, and modern literature, and then kind of a summation of my thoughts on this experience of the Western Canada Starter Kit. So I will say, see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.